In this video, I want to go through some practicalities of actually obtaining strain images and going through the process of actually obtaining it. So when I'm looking at getting a picture, I'm trying to say have the sector width as narrow as possible, but I want to try and include the epicardium and endocardium throughout the cardiac cycle. Here, looking at it, it should have been a little bit wider on the lateral edge, but also trying to have a decent frame rate. So I've got a good frame rate, but I could have actually been a little bit wider. I want to make sure I've got adequate depth that I don't lose the mitral and uh, lateral annulus through dropping it below the sector. So what I'll sometimes do as well is I'll actually zoom onto the image to even make it a bit larger, particularly if I have it's quite deep to the heart. So in this next view, it's actually zoomed up on the left ventricle. And I've also got, got a second one here, just trying to do that. If possible, I'll try and get a view without too much interference with papillary muscles, but not always possible. Here I've got a two-chamber view where, again, I've gone to try and show that I can get as much as possible. And here I've just zoomed on it in the same way, just trying to maximise the size of the image in the window. And then similarly with an apical long axis. And again, I've zoomed up on the image just to try and maximise it in the window. With all of them, I could have gone and said it's a little bit wider just to really emphasise getting the epicardial also in there. But for endocardial strain, which I obtained these for, they're perfectly adequate. Once I actually have an image, I'll then just scroll through until a point where I can see the endocardium really quite clearly. And then I'll track from there. So I'll put my first point down quite close to the mitral annulus, avoiding the valve but close to the annulus. With the actual, there's limited documentation I really can find from Siemens about doing it, but it actually recommends a few points rather than having excessive number of points. I'm talking, you know, six, seven, eight points. And I generally find seven. I'll do one on the base on either side, one on either side around the junction and the mid and basal walls and similarly around the junction the basal and apical walls and one at the apex and so I do my first point there second point there third point there one up at the apex one across one down another one down all the way it really doesn't matter if you're crossing over and missing sections in essence it will find what it wants to track and so there we have that and then we'll, at this point we would run the image and with it, I've actually removed the vector velocities off. So I just want to watch it track through the cycle here. And when I look at it, I look at the particularly the basal point over here and look and think, oh, it's fine there, but suddenly it disappears in Sicily. This one also could be a bit better laterally as well. And when again, I watch it with the vector velocities on, which is often my preferred means of viewing, again, I find that point as being the main one. So what I do is I would then re look at repositioning that point point. Here I sort of dragged it down and we'll see how that one runs in comparison. Again, probably could have mucked around with this one to make it a bit better, but for the sake of this demonstration I'll take that. Here's the, the standard classic view with the vector velocities actually on. This is just showing some of the different views. That's with the, um, yes, yeah, just the endocardial tracking going on. And this is showing you the numbers it would produce. I often will look at this because I think, okay, what type of ejection fraction, what type of volume am I getting? Do they match ones from my Simpsons? Do I trust them? What type of range and distribution do I actually have amongst these various numbers in the sector as well? I would also always look at the bullseye and think, how real does that actually look? If I have a particularly poorly tracking segment, I may consider going back and reassessing that. But there, they're all not too bad. And the overall global longitudinal strain is quite fine. And so here, I'm so happy with that. I'll capture that. There are various other views of which you can capture, looking at different elements of these different waveforms. You're going to find over time these start becoming a lot more important because there's elements on how when the strain actually is occurring and when the peak systolic strain is actually occurring. So some elements to do with looking at revascularization and the like will be with um, Mark Harlin Fox. We'll find that's the timing that changes rather than the peaks. There's also different things from the graph that, from the display here that can be seen in terms of these different sectors. Again, there's further analysis and further ones. I'm not going to go over too much, but just showing you they do exist. 
If you want to turn on the full thickness, then you would have, end up with a sector like this, and then you can change the thickness using the arrows up and down, because you want to include the epicardium, but you don't want to include the pericardium if possible. And this is, the, you know, again, the default display, just with the vector velocities on. And that's using the epicardial contours. And then this is a more classic color display, which you often see in a lot of the other machines. And again, you end up with some more numbers in terms of what's actually going on there. And so you end up with a slightly different number too. It's not the same. This one actually comes slightly higher. It's surprising. It's expected to be a little bit lower normally. So similarly as well with a two-chamber, I'll find a frame where I think, oh, I can see the endocardium quite nicely. I'll then track my first point in the same way up to a midpoint, up to an apical, and then similarly down the other side, just coming in a little bit from some of those trabeculations just there. And again, now I'll watch it track and see how well it tracks. It looks like it tracks fine. I do question the basal inferior wall tracking there. It does seem to have a bit of a strange motion. The vector velocities doesn't look too bad though. And similarly, that doesn't look too bad. When I look again, the numbers, the ejection fraction, the volume, the range, you know, there's some numbers seem a little bit out of context. And when I look here, I end up with this basal, a positive strain in the actual basal inferior wall there. So with that, I would then go back and reposition that point, and then I've rerun it again. And here I can see just from a little bit of repositioning, magically I've got a negative number now. Again, this is just showing that full thickness strain. And similarly with the long axis, I'll repeat that same thing. So I said I'll use those seven different points. And there's a question, as I say, how far you go down into the outflow tracks. That's just a little bit of trial and error to get to the best point there. And in some ways, I probably should have repositioned that point. It could run a little bit better than it actually is. It's not too bad, though. When I look at the actual strain, it looks like it's actually not too bad in terms of tracking. You can, uh, amongst the various other displays, you can also see here, and so you can actually see the radial strain occurring here as the walls actually thicken. And again, again showing the various numbers, and then I get my overall global longitudinal strain, which is actually not too bad when I actually look at the numbers there, and they're all pretty equal to each other, so it makes me trust that the color distribution seems pretty good as well. With left atrial strain, in essence, if I was doing pure left atrial strain, I would have actually picked a now I would have narrowed the section on this to focus just on the left atrium. But for the sake of it, I've just included the four chamber view here. So I'll pick my first point up at the annulus, and then again the same way, I will just come down and around with just a few points. And then from there, I'll just say, okay, let's just run that. And we can see that running pretty well. With this one, we only have this field we actually, which we play with, and this is the you know the numbers we're actually playing with are over here. And as I say, there are different elements that we actually do look at with atrial strain, but I won't go into that too much. With right ventricular strain, it's the same story. We capture a view where we can hopefully see the right ventricle all through systole and diastole, and again a few points up and back down again, and then we'll run it from there. And so it looks like it actually is tracking pretty well there. With this one, we actually get to this view here, and this is where we actually turn off individual sectors. So if I turn off the septal wall, so here I switch off the first one, the second one, and the third one, because I want to get rid of those septal segments. I don't want to include them in the strain because it is RV free wall strain we're looking at. And so this is the number we end up with, so we're looking at that relative 27%. Also gives us a you know, fractional area change there as well as volumes. And this is just showing that view from that four chamber I was showing before. Again, where I can see the wall clearly through there. I often find the atrium questionable because you do seem to have a lot more dropout and there's issues of course with pulmonary veins coming in and left atrial appendages and the like. And the data often does talk about biatrial um, assessment as well. And this was just showing that right ventricular view where I'm looking at the wall through the whole cardiac cycle. All right, I'll leave it there. Thank you.